the melody of that simple, artless little song is still in my ears. But even then, the words passed by my heart. For, if I am to be honest, the entire period of my schooling was nothing other than a constant and worrisome boredom, accompanied year after year by an increased impatience to escape from the strength. I cannot recall ever having been either joyous or blissful during that monotonous, heartless and lifeless schooling which was thoroughly spoiled the best and freest period of our existence. I must admit that even today I cannot help experiencing a certain feeling of envy when I see with how much more freedom, happiness and independence children are permitted to develop in their present century. It still seems hardly credible to me when I observe today how naturally they chat as equals with their teachers, how they hurry to school without a care, whereas we were constantly filled with a feeling of inadequacy, how they may freely express their desires and inclinations of their young and curious souls, both at home and in school, free, independent, and natural beings. Whereas all of us, as soon as we stepped into the hated building, were forced to cringe lest strike our forehead against an invisible yoke. For our school was compulsory, in we drain us, a place where we had to assimilate the science of the not worth knowing. In exactly measured portions, scholastic or scholastically manufactured material which we felt could have no relation to reality or to our personal interests. It was a dull, pointless learning that the old pedagogy forced upon us. Not for the sake of life, but for the sake of learning. And the only truly joyful moment of happiness for which I have to thank my school was the day that I was able to shut the door behind me. By patient waiting, being thus constantly pushed back, the various age groups were valued quite differently than they are today. An 18-year-old student at the gymnasium was treated like a child. He was punished if he was caught with a cigarette, and he had to raise his hand obediently if he wished to leave the room. But a man of 30 was also regarded as an unfledged person, and even one of 40 was not yet considered ripe for a position of responsibility. Once, when was a, once, when a surprising exception occurred and Gustav Mahler was appointed director of Imperial Opera at 38, the frightened whisper and astonished murmur went through Vienna that the first artistic institution of the city has been entrusted to so young a man, completely forgetting that Schubert, a 31 year and Mozart at 36 had already finished their life's work. This distrust that every young man was not quite reliable was felt at the time in all circles. My father would have taken a young man into his business. My father would never have taken a young man into his business. And whoever was unfortunate enough to appear young had to overcome this distrust on all sides. So arose the situation incomprehensible today that youth was a hindrance in all careers and age alone was an advantage. Whereas today, in our changed state of affairs, those of 40 seek to look 30 and those of 60 wish to seem 40 and youth, energy, determination and self-confidence recommend and advance a man. In that age of security, everyone who wished to get ahead was forced to attempt all conceivable methods of masquerading in order to appear older. The newspapers recommended preparations which hastened the growth of beard, and 24 and 25 year old doctors who had finished their examinations wore mighty beards and gold spectacles, even if their eyes did not need them, so that they would make an impression of experience upon their first patients. Men wore long black frock coats and walked at a leisurely pace and whenever possible acquired a slight a slight empen, acquired a slight embon point in order to personify the desired sedativeness. And those who were ambitious strove at least outwardly to be lively youth, since the young were suspected of instability. Even in our 6th and 7th school years, we were refused to carry school bags and used briefcases instantly so that we might not be recognized as attending the gymnasium. All those qualities which today looked, are looked upon as enviable possessions, freshness, self-assertion, 
daring curiosity, youth's lust for life, were regarded as suspect in those days that only had use for substance. It is from this unusual attitude alone that we can understand how the state exploited the schools as an instrument for the maintenance of its authority. Above all else, we were to be educated to respect the existing as perfect, the opinion of the teacher as infallible, our father's words as uncontradictable, the provisions of the state as absolute and the valid for all eternity. A second cardinal principle of the pedigree of those times, which was also applied within the family, directed that young people were not to have things too easy. Before any rights were allowed them, they, had, they, were, they were to learn that they had duties and above all others, the obligation to, of complete docility. A second cardinal principle of the pedigree of those times was, which also was applied within the family, directed that young people were not to have things too easy. Before any rights were allowed to them, they were to learn that they had duties and above all others, the obligation of complete docility. It was to be impressed upon us from the very start that we, who had not yet accomplished anything in life and were entirely without experience, should simply be thankful for all that was granted to us and had no right to ask or demand anything. In my time, this stupid method of intimidation was practiced from earliest childhood. Servants and ignorant mothers frightened three and four-year-old children with the threat of calling a policeman if they did not at once stop being naughty. When we were still in the gymnasium and brought home a poor mark in some unimportant subject, we were threatened with being taken out of school and put to learn a trade, the worst threat a middle-class world, a return to proliterate. When young people in an honest desire for education sought explanation of some earnest, timely problem from adults, they were rebuffed 